Dr. Ben Bickman, Insulin at the Center, Part 3, The Effect of Insulin on Blood Pressure, Triglycerides, and HDL. This is from the Low Carb Down Under YouTube channel, November 14th, 2020. Now, let's move on then to blood pressure as we continue to circle around insulin resistance. This is all through the actions of a hormone called aldosterone. And when insulin goes up, aldosterone goes up. And aldosterone's main effect is to induce the salt and water retention or resorption at the kidneys. And then as volume goes up, um, of course, pressure will go up as well. And so we have an increase in blood pressure. Now, what about the bottom two, triglycerides and HDL cholesterol, two common lipid markers? Low triglycerides and high HDL um, is looked at as an indication of insulin sensitivity. And in contrast, if someone has high triglycerides and low HDL, that is an indication of insulin resistance. Hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance will reduce HDL cholesterol levels in the plasma. And in contrast, they will increase LDL beyond the insulin resistance syndrome. Insulin resistance has a hand in many diseases, including these big three diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, but also several others that you might not expect. I've already touched on body fat, but Alzheimer's disease, uh, the most common form of dementia, stroke, arthritis, migraines, infertility in men and women, and fatty liver disease. Each of these diseases is either caused by or exacerbated by insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is extraordinarily relevant in, in these non-infectious chronic diseases that we're all worried about. I think that if we appreciate the role of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes, we look at type 2 diabetes with a far greater degree of accuracy. So in looking at insulin resistance, commonly the typical marker that we're searching for is looking at glucose. That's what we want to look at and that's what we want to track. Um, and over the life of a person progressing towards type 2 diabetes, the glucose levels are going to look something like this, starting normal and then becoming progressively elevated. In checking metabolic health, currently most doctors will only measure glucose levels. Dr. Bickman argues that it is the insulin level that must also be measured. Insulin ought to be the metric that we're scrutinizing when we wanna understand type two diabetes. And if we superimpose insulin over the lifetime of someone progressing towards type two diabetes, it would look something like this. It starts low, it elevates significantly, and then it starts to come down, but it is nevertheless higher than it was before. That is so important because so commonly this part here where insulin starts to drop and then glucose starts to climb, commonly in the literature we will say insulin is insufficient to keep glucose in control. And that leads some to erroneously conclude that insulin is essentially zero and we use that as justification for insulin therapy. It is misleading to say that insulin is insufficient. Um, we should be clear that it's insufficient to keep glucose in check, but it is still elevated. Anyway, insulin has that progression. I want to note two specific timelines as, we as if we were moving along that x-axis through time, through the life of the person. This first stage is the insulin resistance stage. And you'll note that it is defined by elevated insulin, but normal glucose. This is where most people fall nowadays, unfortunately, certainly in the U.S. and other countries. Remember, in part one, a 2019 study showed that 88% of American adults are metabolically unfit. In other words, are insulin resistant. Um, and then as this progresses, <clears throat> in not everyone but many of these people with type one, uh, with insulin resistance will progress towards type two diabetes, but not all of them. Um, but this is now where insulin is still higher than normal, but it may start to drop. And now glucose levels will start to accelerate and climb. So insulin is elevated and glucose is elevated. But insulin is the key variable here. You can see how it starts to climb so much earlier um, than, than glucose does. And this is played out in the literature, this interesting report finding that in people with type 2 diabetes, if you're looking at insulin and not glucose, we can detect changes a decade, and I would submit 
more than one decade earlier than the glucose changes. And if we're looking at insulin resistance, then this study is making the case that it's insulin, not glucose, that should be used as the marker of the disease. Now, unfortunately, and I alluded to this a moment ago, when we focus on glucose, begin treating the patient with insulin therapy, and then that will most certainly push up the insulin, but conventional medicine would say, who cares? We don't care about the insulin, we care about the glucose, and because the glucose is going down, well, then we're doing what we want. Um, the tragedy in this paradigm, one, we not only have a significant increase in body fat, the diabetic who begins insulin therapy can expect to um, gain um, up to 10 plus kilos easily of, of fat. The risk of heart disease will climb by multiples. The risk of cancer, can, mortality, uh, uh, actually dying from cancer will go up one particular study by about 90% in, uh, with insulin therapy. So these, this has meaningful um, consequences. So what is a takeaway then as I'm wrapping this up? Uh, if we look at insulin levels, I make the cutoff of around six microunits per mil. Uh, this is based on evidence, and I have some studies linked here, where healthy people, um, based on um, people not adhering to a diet that is based on processed foods, they're going to have insulin levels around four microunits per mil, and these are people who have extremely low levels, if any, diabetes at all. Importantly, the average American has um, insulin levels of around nine microunits per mil. And oddly, that fits within the healthy range of most clinical cutoffs for insulin. I think that is misleading because the average American, of course, based on that study published last year, um, is metabolically unfit. So six microunits uh, range that's in the middle of these two cutoffs is going to be one that people should shoot for. The dietary strategy that I believe is best is encompassed in the very name of this low carb Sydney meeting. Now, so in conclusion, these are the aspects of the metabolic, of the insulin resistance syndrome, nowadays referred to as the metabolic syndrome. Summary, the five measures of being unfit. One, glucose, two, waist circumference, three, blood pressure, four, triglycerides, five, HDL. All are improved by obtaining insulin sensitivity.